Hello, and welcome to The Real American Revolution, a series of public television programming interviews with authors, historians, and scholars who focus on what really happened during our American Revolution. Now, my name is Randy Flood, and today's interview is brought to you by The Real American Revolution and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. My guest today is author and historian John Beeks. John graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1966 and served in nuclear submarines until 1974, when he began a business career of executive leadership in technology service companies. Now, John is the co-author, along with Jim Pikett, of Cool Deliberate Courage, John Eager Howard in the American Revolution, and also Light Horse Harry Lee in the War for Independence. In 2015, he published Otho Harlan Williams in the American Revolution. In his most recent book, The Calb, one of the, the Revolutionary War's bravest generals, is already on its way to becoming a bestseller. So John, welcome again to The Real American Revolution. So let's begin. Thank you very much, Randy. Glad to have you with us. Okay, <clears throat> John, why did you write about John Eager Howard? Who was he? Well, I told this story sort of opening my, uh, my writing career, but I had to take my wife to Greensboro, North Carolina for a weekend uh, reunion of her sorority and I drove her there and she stayed in the dormitory so I had the weekend to spend in Greensboro North Carolina and I wound up walking the Guilford Courthouse battlefield for the entire Saturday afternoon I got to the key point where the battle turned and it was the Maryland line that was key to that the key hero was John Eager Howard well I lived in Howard County Maryland for about 20 years at the time I'm a military person. I had a military education. I'm interested in military history. But this is 30 years ago, I guess. I hadn't, I didn't know what Guilford Courthouse was. I'd never heard of it. So I wrote myself a note, when you get home, write, you know, find a book about John Eager Howard and find out who he was and what he did. So I searched and searched and searched. There was no book. So I started myself going to the Maryland Historical Society, and it turned out there's a lot in the archives there. So I tried to put together the story of John Eager Howard. That's why I wrote about him, how I wrote about him, and the more I found out, he really made a tremendous contribution to the success of, of the revolution. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I think in the last 20, 30 years with Jack Buchanan's book, The Road to Guilford Courthouse, people have begun to study the war in the South more. And I think as that has happened, the Maryland Lines contribution, and particularly people like Howard, I think has become more known. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about Howard's early life. What was it like before he joined the Army? Well, he was the son of a prosperous <clears throat> farming family that lived northwest of Baltimore, Maryland. And he was a, he had a good education. I always just say one of the blessings I have is that the people that taught him, he had wonderful handwriting. So I've read, I think, virtually every letter, every letter he ever wrote, and they're easy to read because he wrote so well, but he was very articulate, very well-spoken, very well-educated, although he was basically a farm boy that lived in a local community northwest of Baltimore. Although fortunately for him, his uh, predecessors invested in property north of Baltimore, which became right in the growth path of Baltimore, which played out for him very well. But I say this a lot about officers like Williams, like Lee, like um, Howard, they came from civilian life directly into the military. There was no officer candidate school. They didn't go to a military academy. They didn't have boot camp. They had to go in and learn on the job. And there was wonderful natural talent in these people, high intelligence, good capabilities, but they had to learn to be a soldier on the job. And Howard and Williams and Lee and officers like that did that. It's a wonderful story. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about his uh, activity during the American Revolution. What were his major contributions during the Revolution as an officer? I think he will be most remembered for his magnificent stand at the Battle of Cowpens in January 17, 1781, under the command of General Daniel Morgan. That battle was at a very crucial point. It was about to turn. The British were, looked like they were going to be able to overwhelm the, the uh, Maryland line as they had done, but Howard really coolly and calmly, and as George Washington Green uh, said, with cool, deliberate courage, kept his line together, kept his cool. There's a few people in earth that when the things are the toughest, when there's danger all around you, when there's chaos and noise, people dying all around you, that are able to maintain 
a cool outlook and calm, and people relate, uh, rally to that. Howard had that. He had that in combat. And, you know, on a normal course of a day, he was a nice young farm boy from northwest of Baltimore, Maryland. But in the military, in the crucial time of battle, he really stood out. And then he showed it again at the battlefield from Courthouse, the Battle of Utah Springs. And I think they all did a heroic job at the Race of the Dam. So mm -hmm. he was just one of those rare, rare people throughout all our wars that when the chips are down, he's the person you turn to that's going to get us out of this. Mm -hmm. Well, you just really answered my next question was what he was like as a soldier. But what was his relationship with Nathaniel Green, Otho Holland Williams, and Mordecai Guest, and uh, Smallwood, some of the other officers? It's very interesting. I, I'll just take them one at a time. William Smallwood was the senior officer in Maryland for quite some time. He came from a prosperous family, and he commanded the first Maryland troops that left Annapolis in 1775 and went up to, to uh, New York. Uh, he was in command of the Maryland line at the day of the Battle of Long Island, which was key. He was actually on court martial duty in, in uh, Long Island, I mean, at, at, in Manhattan. But uh, he commanded in the South, and he was the first president of the uh, Society of Cincinnati. So he was always seen by the Maryland troops as the senior military officer in Maryland. Now, there was a time after the Battle of Camden when Howard and Williams were given the option of working for Smallwood, and they chose not to. I always thought that was very, very important because mm -hmm. I think they respected him for his position and all that, but when it came to combat operations, I think they would have preferred other leadership. Mordecai Gist was the hero of the Battle of Long Island. The Maryland 400 basically saved the American Army that day after they, had, uh, the British had turned their flank and the, American Army was totally in retreat. 400 Marylanders fought at Gowana Swamp and held off the entire British Army for a day. Only nine Marylanders got out of that alive and came back. Gis was the leader of that. So he was a magnificent leader. Mm -hmm. He spent a lot of the war back in Maryland recruiting, although he was at the, the Battle of Camden, and he came down toward the end of the war. He wound up marrying and living in Charleston after the war. I think part of why we don't know much about him is his records are half Maryland and half, half, half South Carolina. It's been hard to pull it together. Mm -hmm. Otho Holland Williams was, thir uh, was a clerk. He was, uh, became an orphan at age 13, but he was a clerk in uh, Western Maryland. But he was an outdoorsman you know, of the time. He, he had a musket and he could shoot and he hunted and all those kinds of things. He went into the Army with the first rifleman on June 14, 1775, the birthday of the Army. He went in as a lieutenant in that rifle corps. They marched to Boston in three weeks, were there for the Boston siege. He came back to New York at the Battle of Fort Washington. Washington, George Washington was standing at Fort Lee with a, uh, uh, a uh, looking across and seeing the battle at Fort Washington. And the riflemen were, it was unbelievable how they defended that. He never forgot that for the rest of Washington's life. And Williams was a deputy commander of that. Whenever a rifleman approached Washington, he would do what he could to help him out. Um, so then he became a prisoner of war. And think about this young 26-year-old that walked to Boston in three weeks. While he was a prisoner, he got tuberculosis. Mm. And fast forward to age 45, he died of consumption, as they're called in those days. But in the meantime, he became acting adjutant general of the Washington, the army under Washington for a few months. He was adjutant general under Cal when he marched south under Gates and then under Green. So they all respected his military ability, his administrative ability, and he was a great writer. A lot of we, the history we have of the South, the original history he wrote. Mm -hmm. And he was also a terrific combat soldier. Mm -hmm. He led the screening force and the race of the Dan that I've talked about to protect the Green's army as they retreated. He was really pointed out at the Battle of Utah Springs, Congress awarded him a sword. And remember I said he came into the army in 1775 as a, as a lieutenant. He became a brigadier general, Green recommended him for that. So this is one, one military career that's a rifleman, he's wounded, he's a prisoner, he's an adjutant general, He's a, a, a combat leader and awarded the sword by Congress and ultimately a brigadier general. So mm -hmm. I think that, uh, 
And the other thing about Williams and Howard, it's interesting that for a short time after the war, they were sort of two young uh, veterans looking around. They'd go to parties, looking for ladies. They'd talk back and forth about ladies. Howard had more money than he had. He had a carriage and so forth. But then Williams got married and that sort of stopped that. But they were friends for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that goes with the adjutant general and one of the commanders of one of the regiments. So they were close friends by the end of the war. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, John Edgar Howard had a very distinguished career after the war. So let's talk about his life after the war. And as a follow-up to that, how is he remembered today? Well, um, you know, he was, he, he was very prominent in Maryland, certainly. He, he married Peggy Chu, uh, a, a prominent uh, Philadelphia aristocrat, in about 1787. George Washington attended the, the wedding and the, the dinner afterwards. So Washington knew of Howard. He knew he was one of his. Uh, Daniel Morgan called him old swords, my old swords. That was the, the, the soldiers that he respected the most. So he was certainly in favor with Washington. He served in the uh, House of Representatives in 1787. He became uh, governor of Maryland for three one-year terms from 88 to 91. Uh, he served in the Maryland Senate then. They elected him to the U.S. Senate. He served in the U.S. Senate until uh, 1803. And in 1816, he was a candidate for vice president of the United States. So he was very much a George Washington Federalist. Uh, on that side. And most of the society of Cincinnati and the military officers tended to revere Washington and to follow him politically. Another thing that's not widely known, I think, there was a time when the uh, Secretary of War, Henry Knox, wanted to go off. He had a, a state in Maine that he was building and so forth. So we needed to replace the Secretary of War. It became James McHenry, eventually, for whom Fort McHenry is named. Mm -hmm. But it was offered to Howard. George Washington offered it to Howard, and the person that carried the offer to Howard in Baltimore was, was Light Horse Harry Lee. But Howard begged off. He said that he had too much uh, business, too much family concern. And it really is true that that wound he got at the Battle of Utah Springs at the end of the war, he had a very serious wound in the left shoulder. And it affected him for the rest of his life, particularly during cold weather. The War of 1812 came to Baltimore, and of course, Samuel Smith became famous for leading the defenses and all that kind of thing. But Howard participated from the sidelines. He raised money, he gave money. And very interestingly, after all that was over, Howard led a delegation to go see President Madison to get Madison to have the federal government reimburse Baltimore for the, the money they spent to defend Baltimore. So he was a politician of, of the Federalist persuasion. He was very successful, again, a governor, state senator, U.S. Senator, candidate for Vice President of the United States, and a man with enough self-confidence and esteem throughout the uh, country to go talk to the president, to go to the White House and, and uh, say, we need money for Baltimore to, to reimburse us for our expenses. Mm -hmm. Very distinguished uh, member of Baltimore. When Lafayette came and visited America, uh, he came to Baltimore in 1824. Howard was in command of the delegation that met him. He was received at, at Fort McHenry. And the tent that they had that day, just as a side, was Washington's marquee. So uh, Lafayette was received uh, in the tent that Washington had used during the Revolutionary War. Interesting. Well, the other thing I'd say about him in Baltimore, he was a benefactor. Mm -hmm. The Washington Monument was put up in 1815. It was the first Washington Monument in the country. It still stands. He gave the land for that. He gave the land for the Basilica of the Assumption in Baltimore. He gave a land for the University of Maryland Medical School. So he was a great benefactor of the city of Baltimore. Mm -hmm. What's he named after today? What, what's he named after? Uh, 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 isn't he is, uh, Howard County, Maryland, perhaps? And Howard County, Maryland is named for him, yes. I had a slide earlier in, in, a, in a presentation I did which some Marylanders are interested in. He was the street commissioner for Maryland for a while. So believe it or not, there's a street in Maryland named John, there's one named Eager, and there's one named Howard. <laughs> but there's also Lexington, Saratoga, Fayette, which is for Lafayette. There's a Utah place. Mm -hmm. So the streets of Baltimore all have very Revolutionary War names because he was a street commissioner and, and uh, made that happen. Mm -hmm. 
but basically Howard County, Maryland, I think is probably his, his most significant. Uh, there's a Howard Community College, you know, there's Howard University, although that's for O.O. O. Howard, the right. Civil War general. Mm -hmm. But I think basically, I, I've, I've talked in Maryland about him a number of times now, and I, I think it's safe to say he's pretty well forgotten. Yeah. What's the one thing that Americans really need to know about John Eager Howard, though, that's largely unknown? Or basically, what's the key takeaway from your book that readers really need to remember about John Eager Howard above anything else? I think this is one of the men that stands strong in the storm. You may not pick him out of a group on a, you know, on a, on a Sunday outing or a pleasant you know, review somewhere or a party or those kinds of things. He'd be kind of stoic kind of reserved, gentlemanly and courtly, of course. But in the key moment of battle, when the chips are down, when everything's on the line, this is a man that would stand tall, steely determination, calm demeanor that people would rally to, the kind of leader in military and combat that saves the day, which he did many times. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Well, John Beeks, thank you so much for talking to us today about John Eager Howard and the American Revolution. It's a pleasure to have you on The Real American Revolution. And folks, this is the book, Cool, Deliberate Courage, John Eager Howard and the American Revolution by John Beeks. It's published by Nautical and Aviation Publishing in Mount Pleasant, South Carolina. This is it right here. An excellent read. You really enjoy it. Matter of fact, when I first read it, I couldn't put it down. I had to finish it to, from beginning to end. It's really an excellent book. And so join us again. Our, our um, guest today has been John Deeks, Cool Deliberate Courage, John Eager Howard and the American Revolution. So join us again for another exciting presentation at the Real American Revolution. My name is Randy Flood, and so long for now.